Final seconds of the game. A chance to score and the chance has gone begging. If your business's commerce platform keeps missing the target on golden opportunities, get the MVP you deserve. Get Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool that you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed football boots from Shopify's in-person POS system, or you're vending vintage shirts on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ranks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com forward slash ranks to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash ranks. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello, Rank Squad, and welcome to Ranks FC. It's your favourite football podcast back for another week and a busy week at that. The first of two podcasts going out here on the feed. This one, and then there'll be a Champions League takeaway as well tomorrow night after those games have finished. There'll also be the return of UE Ultras over on our YouTube channel and on the Patreon as a podcast as well. So make sure you're getting involved with all of those bits and bobs. My name is Jack Collins and I'll be your host today. And joining me, my co-host as ever, our transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones. How you doing, mate? I'm very good, mate. Um, you do have a couple of revelations to make today. Um, if you're on the Patreon, you already know about them. But Jack Collins made two in the bag calls on the back of the weekend's games. And before we do things we love, mate, there's nothing anybody loves more than a Jack Collins in the bag call. We're at the start of Feb and two more league titles are sewn up. Do you want to reveal all? Yeah, I think it's important that we do make sure that <laughs> the bag calls are, are made correctly. Yeah, Real Madrid, La Liga in the bag, but not the second one that perhaps everybody was expecting after this weekend. I've decided the Sporting have won the league, which is nuts considering they are actually just level on points with Benfica. They do have a game in hand. But after watching Benfica's performance of the weekend and watching Sporting's absolute demolition job, another 5-0, they've scored an incredible amount of goals in 2024 alone. I'm pretty confident they're going on to win the title. So yeah, two more bad calls. La Liga and the Primeira both wrapped up as far as I'm concerned. Incredible, mate. Yeah, everyone remember, Jack has never got a call wrong. As soon as he does, the game's over. We've been going mm. for three years or four years? This is its third year. Third year. And he's never got one wrong. No, this so is that... its fourth year. This is its fourth yeah, year. Yeah, I think as I say, I think it's fourth year, yeah. So it's a great track record. He doesn't he doesn't wait and wait and wait to make sure it's a guarantee. He does make some bold calls. This one from Portugal being a key example of that. Um but I love the Real Madrid call because obviously last week I ranked Real Madrid as my number one candidate to go and win the Champions League. And it helps them if they've already got the league sewn up because they can just focus and keep all their best players back for the Champions League. So suits me, mate. I'm happy with that. It's not like the B team are particularly bad either. The rotation's <laughs> coming in, is it? It's not a problem for Real Madrid. Right, so let's start with things we love. We're going to be talking today later about five young managers in demand this summer and where they might end up. But I wanted to bring back things we love this week. Yeah, absolutely. I love that Harry Kane trolled everyone. We thought he was going to Germany to win trophies with Bayern Munich. 
that's not actually why he's there. Do you know that? He's going potless. The only reason he's gone there is on a scouting mission for England. He's getting used to all the pitches. He's getting used to life in Germany because the trophy he's going to win is the Euros. The European Championship is coming home, Jack. And that is why Harry Kane actually moved to Germany, who hosts that tournament in the summer. We thought, ah, he's taking an easy route in to try and get some trophies here, going to Bayern Munich. They'll definitely win the Bundesliga or something else. No, they won't. Uh, Harry Kane currently not on course to win a trophy in German football this season. Knocked out of the DFB Pokal. They've lost uh, the German Super Cup to RB Leipzig. Seems pretty unlikely they're going to win the Champions League, given the mess that they're in. And they now trail Bayer Leverkusen by five points as a result of losing 3-0 to them at the weekend. Bayern, they never go potless, right? Like the last time this happened was in 2012 when they finished runners-up in the league and, and in the DFB Pokal and they lost the Champions League final to Chelsea. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a rarity, a rare event. But I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, right, no, right. the reason he's there is because he's, he's just doing a job for England. He's, he's, he's being uh, very patriotic here. So thank you, Harry Kane. Um, and good luck to Bayer Leverkusen because you are on the brink of winning a league title. Oh, it's, it was an amazing game. And I think it's probably worth discussing it at this point because look, the idea of somebody toppling, I think what was named this week in the press as the tyranny of Bayern in the Bundesliga. We thought we were going to see it last year and Borussia Dortmund choked it on the final day. Mm. And this year, it does look like this Bayer Leverkusen side are made of sterner stuff. But more than anything, I think Bayern choked this game. And I think in particular... Thomas Tuchel did. And we did talk about this extensively on Monday's show, but I wanted to kind of bring it up here because the switch in formation that Tuchel went with, he went to mirror, basically, the Leverkusen 3-4-3, was the first kind of admittance of defeat. It was the first note that you were going, we're coming into this on the back foot. We're trying to match up to a team that have played this system all season long. And actually, it was the moment I went, oh, okay. They haven't gone, oh, we're going to be able to play our own system. We're going to dominate. And the fact is that when they did that, the patterns, the combinations, everything went out the window. And Bayer Leverkusen went, all right, then have the ball. Because you don't know what to do with it in this system. You've not played in this system for the entire season. You're actually in a place where we want you to be. And it also allowed Leverkusen to double up or match up directly on the players that might have been able to get into the game. Harry Kane, as you've mentioned there, wasn't able to get into this at all. He was marshaled perfectly by by Bayern Leverkusen's offence because of the way that the teams matched up. And actually someone like Pavlovich, who's been a very rare, bright spot in this season for Bayern Munich, the player that maybe has saved them 70 million on buying a defensive midfielder, wasn't able to do any of the things he normally does because Granit Xhaka went (laughs) one-on-one, go on then. And actually everything played into Leverkusen's hands. And I think that Yes, Thomas Muller spoke afterwards. The players have to take some responsibility on, obviously. But also, Tuchel deciding to kind of take the coward's way out in inverted commas by basically being like, okay, no, what I actually have here is a team that I think are going to need to go one for one to stop them overloading the flanks. And actually, Leverkusen switched that up by switching to Stanisic, uh, right, but yes, he scored, but actually he was a far more defensive presence than what we've come to expect from someone like Jeremy Frimpong, who came off the bench as an out-and-out winger and then scored the decisive third goal. It all felt like Bayern came into this and went, oh, we're underdogs. That is so not Bayern. That's so not what Bayern Mm -hmm. do. And from that moment onwards, you're going, they're going to get beaten here because they're playing a team that know this system far better than they do, who will be able to use those combinations every time Leverkusen got the ball. And they didn't get it all that much. But when they did get the ball, you were like, right, they're just walking their mm. way ease through this Bayern team who felt out of position, out in different ways where they didn't know where they were. Sasha Bowie having to play left wing back when he was signed as a right back, incredibly confusing. And all of it just fell apart on the basis of where that tactical setup looked like. And it took, took way too long to change anything. And that's where Bayern fell, fell away here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, too cool over complicating matters likely I'd say at this point to be on the way to losing his job uh, at Bayern Munich so got himself in a real mess Thomas Tuchel from his time when he was Chelsea manager and losing that job and now ended up at Bayern and potentially losing that job 
it'll soon be a manager out of work, I think, that we'll be talking about on this podcast, trying to find him a new job. Um, but credit to Alonso, who I'm sure we'll speak about too later on in this episode, for being bold in his selections for that match um, and for persisting in the belief that he has in this group of players and the way that they can attack a game and trust his own game plan. So it's been an incredible build. And yeah, let's watch. I mean, I said as well on the Patreon the other day, the thing I really loved that I went to get a Chinese takeaway on Saturday after the Fulham game. And there was a few blokes crowded around the TV while they're waiting for their takeaway, uh, watching Leverkusen against Bayern Munich. Um, It was great to see. Like they were genuinely interested in the game. And all different ages too. Like one of the la- when it was probably like sixty years old, and you know, typically like someone about my dad's age, you know, doesn't really know anything about Bundesliga. But I could tell he was like properly like interested. At the time, I think Leverkusen were two 0 up, and um, obviously from an in- English perspective, like there's the Harry Kane point of view, there's the Xavi Alonso perspective, but also the perspective that nobody outside of Bayern Munich wants Bayern Munich to win the league this year. And uh, yeah, that was a nice little. Um, a nice little moment just to realise that where the Bundesliga has got to this season in terms of having one of the best title races around. Yeah, maybe the Cologne fans it might be the only other team supporting maybe, Bayern yeah, in, true, in, in, true. in this in this title race. But yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. And Chabi Alonso out tacticking Tommy Tactics is, is really quite something for the yeah Tommy the Tactics. Books, that right? nickname might be gone, mate. Um, I think it might I'm not be. sure that's going to stick too much longer. No, maybe not. Uh, I'm going to come on to my thing I love and. The biggest and best game of this weekend took place on Sunday evening in Abidjan between Ivory Coast and Nigeria in the AFCON final. Now, it has been a remarkable tournament from pretty much start to finish. It has had absolutely everything in terms of drama, in terms of upsets, in terms of narratives, in terms of late goals. It's been phenomenal. I think I put it out there that it's been my favorite tournament that I've watched in a long, long, long time, perhaps ever. That's how brilliant it has been. And we saw right in the group stages the fact that Ivory Coast sneaked through as the fourth of four third place teams due to the fact that Mozambique scored two injury time goals to equalize against Ghana and send them out, which was a shock in itself. But those two goals sent Ivory Coast into the round of 16. And from there, we're kind of looking at it going, there's absolutely no way that this team can win this tournament. They sack their manager, Gasset. They try to loan a manager, Hervé Renard, from the French women's team. And the French Federation take one look at them and go, no, absolutely not, you lunatics. And so they turn to a Mercify, who was an assistant and has never managed before. And he steps up. Four games later, he has won AFCON. His record is four from four. <laughs> I think they should, he should retire. He should 100% walk away. It is never, ever getting any better than this because it's just an incredible moment for, for everyone. But you see what happens. They then go come from behind to turn things around against Senegal, who were tournament favorites. They then squeak past Mali, despite having 10 men. Uh, 70 or so minutes. They then squeak past TR Congo with a goal from the returning Sebi Allaire, who fires the ball into the ground and over the goalkeeper. It's either absolutely brilliant or incredibly lucky, and I'll leave you to decide on that one. And then they come into this final against Nigeria, who have been sensational throughout the tournament, who have conceded one goal from open play in the entire campaign. And they look at it and they go, well, there's no way they're going to be able to overturn this. And yet, in this final, there is only one team on the pitch, and it's the Ivory Coast. Nigeria collapse in on themselves. The defensive solidity that we've seen through this tournament, still on show to a point. But even with all that said, what happened in the group stage between these two? 1-0 to Nigeria, William Truster Kong scores. What happens in the early stages of this game? Ivory Coast dominate, William Truster Kong scores for Nigeria against the run of play, completely against the run of play. And you're going, here we go again. This is it now. Nigeria will sit on this. They will defend this lead and they will be crowned AFCON champions. But Frank Kessier, who comes up big again, he came up big in the game against Senegal. He comes up big here 
and he scores the equaliser from a header, from a corner, which is the way that Nigeria got there first. And all it is is waves on waves on waves of Ivory Coast pressure. And the, the stadium is starting to get more and more and more enthused enthralled with everything that's happening. And then Simon Adingra, as he's been doing all games, skins Olaina down this left-hand side. He chips the ball in and Sebi Ale scores one of the best goals you will ever see. And when you're kind of looking at the different elements of this, the flick around the corner, the, the toe on the ball to sort of hook it past the goalkeeper from this cross is sensational. And I think that Sometimes you get these moments that are kind of written in the stars. Yes, Sebi Allaire has had the most incredible story, comeback story. 12 months ago, he was just starting to play top flight football again, working his way back from recovering from testicular cancer. Now he has scored the goal in the semi final that sends his nation to the final and the goal in the final to win it for them. It was as if the narrative gods had written this into existence. Nobody gave this Cote d'Ivoire team a chance a snowball's chance in hell coming through that group stage in the way that they did. Picking up a record defeat to Equatorial Guinea. Never lost by four goals before on home soil. And here they are. A couple of weeks later, champions of Africa. The scenes at the parade, absolutely incredible. The zombie elephants back from the dead to go and win the tournament on their own patch. Just the most incredible story ever. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I obviously wasn't um, absorbed in the tournament like you were, but I did watch the final, and yeah, the scenes were mad. I mean, the stadium was packed, um, colourful, like vibrant, like manic when the when the goal went in. Um, there really seemed no hope of a Nigeria comeback once they went behind. No, yeah, um, they were dead and buried. They were gone, heads gone, absolutely defeated. Um, Alaire didn't actually celebrate as much as I thought he might. Like he was actually quite composed given the the moment that he he just pulled up. But um, yeah, absolute uh, magic and a tournament that. Well, I mean, I, I think typically it's it's uh, it's mocked, isn't it? Quite often, Afcon for various reasons. But I haven't seen any of that actually this year. I, haven't, I really haven't seen any of it. It was the tournament to end all tournaments. Like, I, I honestly don't think we've ever seen a tournament with as much narrative, as much drama, as much going on and as much excitement around it. And look, we had even international football skeptics tuned in to AFCON. That's some going. Can't wait. It's only, it's only what, 14 months to the next AFCON, which is Morocco <laughs> next summer. You'll be there, Everyone man. Everyone will be very, very excited about what's going down there. And with that, it's probably time for us to call this first segment to a close. We'll be back after the break to talk about five young managers in demand this summer and where they might end up. Don't go anywhere. I talk about this all the time, but I really do love coffee, Rank Squad. I've tried pretty much everything there is to offer out there, but recently I came across a new coffee experience that has blown my mind. Laird's Superfood Creamers are crafted from the highest quality, all-natural, real food ingredients. I really don't think I'll be going back to anything else. My coffee journey feels complete. Are you ready to feel more energised, focused and supported? Go to LairdSuperfood.com and add nourishing plant-based foods to fuel you from sunrise to sunset. Use our promo, ranks 15 at checkout to save 15% off your purchase today. Our promo code ranks15 at checkout to save 15% off your purchase today. Welcome back to Ranks FC. Yes, it's me talking and not Jack. You didn't expect that, did you? But Jack is actually doing a ranking. Yep, it's one of those rarities like Bayern Munich not winning a trophy. They're becoming less rare these days. They are actually. Well, we've got no choice. Only two of us. Can't do all of them. Um... But yeah, we've got a ranking that's definitely far more suited to Jack because he's going to delve into five young managers that are being touted or should land big jobs around Europe this summer. And he's going to dig into some potential destinations and landing spots for these guys as well. Um, I saw the list that he was looking at first of all, and I thought, yeah, two of them maybe I could give a bit of detail on, but the other three I can offer nothing. This is all yours, Jack. Go for it. And actually, um, we should probably give a shout out to the Patreon um, where we actually were looking for some inspiration. It's obviously a bit of a weird time of the year when you start to wonder like 
what do people want to talk about at this at this moment in time? Um, and thought, do you know what? We're going to go to the Patreon community and literally just say, what shall we rank? Um, and there's loads of stuff come in, Jack. I don't know if you've seen everything that we've uh, received on there since putting that post out, but there are loads of ideas that are probably literally could fill a year's worth of podcasts. Probably of stuff will. That you are, <laughs> they might have to because you and me don't come up with this many ideas, but I think uh, it might have been Aaron's one that you grasped onto, the top five upcoming managers, and uh, that's probably the the brain of where this idea came from. Yeah, shouts out to Aaron. It's a slight slight twist on that, but I think it's um, interesting. I'm not necessarily the best of the of the bunch, but I think people who are in demand and potentially will be called upon in various places this summer. So I'm going to start in Stuttgart with Sebastian Hernes, which is a name you might recognise, not from his playing career, which was pretty mediocre by anyone's standards, but especially this family's standards, but because Sebastian is the nephew of Bayern legend Early Hernes, who was a brilliant player for the club and is now one of the powerhouses in the boardroom, and the oh. son of his brother Dieter, who is slightly less well-known, but racked up 224 appearances and 102 goals for Bayern himself. So it's a pretty powerful family here. So Hernes basically gave up on his playing career at 29 after a couple of injuries and knocking around through various teams. He had a few Bundesliga appearances, but not many. And he progressed through coaching the youth setups at Leipzig and then Bayern. He guided Bayern's second team to basically the third tier title back in 2020 in Germany. A couple of names you might recognize in the setup. Joshua Zerksi, now at Bologna. We'll talk about him again later. And a little known fella called Jamal Musiala. Um, anyway, Hernes went off to Hoffenheim for his first senior job and he did okay. Two seasons where the club finished mid-table. They decided they wanted more from that. They haven't got more from it since he's left, so it's probably worth bearing that in mind. He took a year break and then he took over at Stuttgart in April 2023 with a club in absolutely dire straits in the relegation battle. Completely and utterly revitalized that Stuttgart side who looked destined for the drop. They lost just one of their last eight games, which pushed them up into 16th in that relegation playoff. And then they won the relegation playoff 6-1 on aggregate against Hamburg over two legs in a pretty comprehensive demolition to be honest um, and now seven months on they're third in the Bundesliga table and Hernes has unleashed I think the most dynamic strike pairing that the Bundesliga has seen since the days of Dzeko and Grafitz for Wolfsburg which was actually under Felix Magat of all people um, mm. with Sergio Jurassi and Dennis Undav having scored 31 goals between them in the league so far it truly is pretty stunning numbers now Ernest isn't wedded, I would say, to a system, although at Stuttgart this year, he has mainly used a 4-2-3-1. He experimented with three at the back systems during his time at Hoffenheim. But I think what we've seen from all of these jobs and experiences is that he's found himself getting the best of talented players. And I think top clubs will be looking at that as a major benefit. He's got a little bit of that Red Bull DNA in him because of that time at Leipzig in terms of how his side set up and press but it's not as entrenched as it would be with someone like Matthias Jaisler or Jesse Marsh, for example, which I think gives Ernest a little bit more flexibility in what he's trying to do, but also in terms of what his teams look like. So it's cliche, where next? But Bayern should be interested if Tuchel does eventually go this summer. Now, this is something that's being thrown around and Tuchel was actually asked ahead of the Stuttgart game earlier this season if he saw Ernest as a potential successor. Now he flipped, which is probably worth noting because it suggests that he he's feeling some sort of pressure from that area. He was like, I'm not going to talk about my successes. And he was like, yes, he's doing a very good job, but he's not going to, why would I talk about my successes? Which suggests that there is something at the back of his mind going, this could be a problem in the future. Now, Leverkusen could become an option should Xabi Alonso end up walking away this summer. Whilst at Borussia Dortmund, they still seem to be undecided on their future with Edin Terzic. That one in particular, I think, could be really interesting. But depending on what Bayern do this summer, now obviously there's Jose Mourinho linked at the moment. Now, whether that's true or not is, is up for debate, but apparently he's learning German. Um, but there will be plenty of names thrown around if the Bayern job becomes available. This one, I think, would be a very, very interesting place for Bayern to go. Yeah, I mean, obviously a gamble, um, given 
that he's still growing as a coach. I mean, it is interesting. He's only 41 and he's already been coaching for like 12 years. Yeah. Um, so he's obviously like taken this decision very early. He started off in under 19 football. Um, but that's going to have stood him in good stead to at that age be gr- getting a grasp of the next, the future of coaching, if you like. And if you're somebody of that age that players can actually relate to, I think you're in a good position. And if he's already been coaching lads for the last 10 years or so and coming through the system with them, that's going to be incredible for him as we get to this stage now where those players and players of the future are going to be looking for moves, looking for trust, looking to give advice on what other players should expect from him. That's going to really, really stand him up well. So I like that fact about him. I mean, it's very different to Jose Mourinho if Bayern Munich are looking for... It's two very different routes. ...their next it? coach. I tell you what, I was talking to someone today about Mourinho and they said, well, there's one strong reason to believe Mourinho would go for Bayern. The, other, the, the only Liga? lasting top European league he hasn't won. And if he can walk away saying, I did it all, then you could understand why there might just be an inkling there of Jose Ego itching for it. But I think Mourinho would take the Bayern job. I just don't know if Bayern would go for Mourinho. That's the, uh, yeah. that's the flip side yeah. of it. This, no, has been, a- this has been touted before. Now, obviously, there was the, the Tuchel bit, but also it's been pushed to the Bayern top brass. And they were like, look, we're happy. And they've spoke about you know backing Tuchel at least to the end of the season. But I do think they were like, oh, there's a family link. There's also a professional link. And we've worked with him before. He's someone who we think, you know, has the capacity to go on and be an excellent manager. And, you know, that's, that's high praise. Yeah. The Bayern no, top it's an brass. interesting so one. I think this is one to keep an eye on, if you will. Nice, like, get, yeah, no, I appreciate you putting it on my radar. The, well, if he gets that job in the summer, I think we can come back to this and be like, that was a good spot. <laughs> we picked that yeah, one up. Yeah, yeah. ITK Jack Collins. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Right, let's go on to four, where I've got Thiago Motta at Bologna. Bologna right in the hunt for the Champions League places in Serie A. And much of that, I think, is down to the influence of Motta, who has established himself as an excellent coach but also someone who can deal with the off-pitch pressures as well. Gives it straight when he talks to the media. He's got that authority who's seen the heights of the game, and yet he was also willing to put the hard yards in in terms of getting his coaching career off the ground. And This is something I talk about quite a lot, right? And it's something I've mentioned about Xabi Alonso, and it's something that I think holds English coaches back because a lot of them get jobs without going through and putting in the effort and the yards at second steering teams, you know, in youth setups, I think it's something that the European game does better than the English game in, in, in many ways. Like his coaching career didn't start all that well. He joined former club Genoa in 2019. He lasted two months. He was lambasted and ridiculed in the press for a misconception that he wanted to play a 2-7-2 formation when actually he was talking about the vertical lines in a 4-3-3. Yeah. And mm. everyone made loads about this. They were like, oh, Genoa going to be playing without a goalkeeper, etc." Turned out he just kind of wanted to play in a pretty normal setup with two players wide seven through the middle, including the goalkeeper and two on the other flank. Why did he explain it like that? Was there ever, he, did it ever He actually said, I play a four, uh, you know, I'd like to play a four, three, three, but I think, you know, you could also see that as a two, seven, two with the goalkeeper as the first attacker and the attackers as the first defenders. And I was like, all oh, right, okay. That actually makes far more sense when he's explained like that. Yeah, <laughs> it was just quite like, helpful for us to understand. That's how you think of football. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, Pep Guardiola talks about vertical lines all the time, right? And where players are in those spaces. And I think that that, that's important. So Motta then moved to Spezia, who he kept up on a shoestring budget. And basically they all wanted him to stay. They offered him a new contract. He said no and made the move to Bologna. He led them to a ninth place finish last year, which is their highest in a decade, if I'm not mistaken. And this season they're in the race for Europe, despite having the third youngest squad in Serie A. And they're doing this because they're incredibly aggressive. Much as Motta was as a player, they set up in a pretty uncompromising 4-2-3-1. He's turned youngsters and outcasts into one of the most meanest defensive units in the league. And a special shout out here for Riccardo Calafiori, who signed from Roma. Motta has morphed him from a flying wing back into an exceptional young centre half. And that transition alongside, you know, a player next to him who has come in for the first time, young Dutch defender in Sam Berkema. Together, they have been remarkable. And the fact is that neither of them at the club last year. 
And one of them was a wing back. And in what we're seeing from this Bologna side defensively is so impressive. And at the other end, Joshua Zerxe, who I mentioned earlier, let go from Bayern and is now shifting to one of the best out and out and all round centre forwards in the league. Behind him, Scott Lewis Ferguson is moving around so much that he appears to be on the pitch twice quite a lot of the time. That's his work rate <laughs> under Thiago Motta. And I can only think that that's been instilled from the very top. So where next? For me, this is where Barcelona should be looking. Motta's been through the mill. He's worked his way up. He's suffered the pressure and he's come out smelling the roses and improving players, which I think is key. He's not quite a La Masia graduate, but he did move to Barcelona at 17 and spent eight years there. So he knows the drill. If they can afford it, I think this is the smartest move that Barcelona could make. If they can afford it. I mean, if they can't afford him, who can they afford? Because, they, you know, they can't well, be Rafa Marquez, much. who's the B team coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's, which that's, is free. But that's what that explains it perfectly because, you know, Motta um, certainly has a good reputation in the game at the moment. And I've heard him mentioned a lot for um, having a high ceiling. But again, another 41 year old, he's only been coaching for a few years and if you can't afford him where, where are you going to be looking so that that is definitely an interesting element of it definitely helps that he's got an upbringing in Spanish football that means he understands the traditions and the expectations particularly of Barcelona so that's good but also the fact that he's he's been a player in Italy he's, he's been in France too with PSG you know such an all-round understanding of the European game yep. and the connections he's built along the way too and the different philosophies of football that he's played under. This is a guy, like, obviously, he's going to land a big job, isn't he? And I think just talking about those two players that you mentioned then, um, Ferguson and Xerxes, like, no coincidence, both of those players suddenly big transfer rumours again about them already at the moment. Uh, just goes to show how he's elevating their status too. So... This is definitely one. I mean, I didn't, I don't know anything really about him as a manager beyond what you've just told me, but I've heard his name mentioned a lot recently. Um, this guy's going places, isn't he? He's not going to be around uh, Bologna very long. No, I, I really, really like him. And I think that what they've done and the way that they play, they're, you know, they're, they're direct at times. They like to, you know, like to go longer a little bit more than some teams in Italy. But generally, I just think that the way that they can mix things up and the fact that they have that steel in the middle of the park. Now, that's not steel that's necessarily been bought in either. That's steel that he's managed to coach. is something that Barcelona completely lack right now. And to be able to influence that and, and bring in a little bit of that kind of hard, hard yards attitude that maybe has been missing. And look, Xavi's the first to say this. He was like, last year, we fought for every ball. This year, we just haven't done that. And we're not good enough to not do that. I think that Mott is the kind of coach that would be able to instill that steel back in to Barcelona. And that's why I think this is where they should be looking. But it will be interesting to see who else is in this conversation because you'd imagine Juve are in there. Now he has Inter background as well. So whether that is a thing that he would consider or not is a, is a different question. But I do think it's, it's intriguing to see what happens next with Mott because he's going to be on the name. And look, something I kind of didn't mention at the top of this list, but probably should have, is that we're probably going to have a fair few big jobs open up this summer, right? We obviously know that the Liverpool job is going to open up. We know that the Barcelona job is going to open up. We've talked about the fact that we think the Bayern job is going to open up. But also, as these players and coaches move, other jobs will also open up in the second tier of, of what people are looking for as well. Because if Xabi Alonso leaves Leverkusen, then the Leverkusen job opens up. The Borussia Dortmund job might open up. And I think that what we're seeing is maybe a little bit of a managerial merry-go-round this summer that maybe we didn't have last year. So it's going to be a little bit more intriguing, I think, in terms of managerial moves this summer than it was last year, given yeah. that, you know, there was World Cup to consider, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Right, at third, I've got Michelle at Girona. Um, might be a relatively new name to most people, but in Spain, he's building a bit of a reputation as someone who can get the best out of his size. At 37, Michel took over his boyhood club, Rayo Vallecano, guiding the club to promotion in his first full season as boss. He struggled in La Liga the season after, but when he was sacked, he took the drop down again to Huesca, where he won the league again. But it was a similar story in La Liga with Huesca, and they struggled and were eventually relegated. Third time, though, is a charm. Took over as Girona, racked up his third Segunda promotion. This time, the path went straight because... 
despite the fact that most people predicted that they would struggle. He led the club to a ninth place finish last season and they were fighting for a European spot until that final day with Osasuna, who eventually got it. We all know what's gone down this year with the little Catalan club challenging for the title with Real Madrid, or at least till the weekend, challenging for the title with Real Madrid. And what's been interesting is that through these jobs and through these different teams that have come up with him from the Segunda and, and he's tried to play based on his principles. He's tried to play brave, attacking, fluid football. And especially as your owner, this has been based around a 4-2-3-1. And whilst it didn't work out perfectly at either Rio or Huesca, I think that you could see the principles in his mind starting to take shape of how he wanted to play. And finally, as your owner, it's all just blossoms. Now, their greatest strength is they are the way that they utilize wide combinations, I think. And the pairings down the flanks have been incredibly impressive. Jan Kauto and Viktor Shankov play in a very different way to Dali Blind and, and Savio on the other flank. Kauto likes to get forward, likes to get into the final third and make things happen. Shankov tucks inside and, and, and tries to play as more of kind of inside forward. Savio is more of a traditional winger and he does like to go at his man and get round him. He does cut inside and score goals. We've seen that this season. But there is a little bit more of that kind of touchline hugging ability to what he does. And Dali Blind tucks inside him for the underlap. They provide those kind of, you know, people laughing at Thiago Motta with those vertical lines, right? But that's what Girona have done really well this season. Those lines going forward, they have players in each of them. The Pep Guardiola approach in many ways. So behind that, you know, we've seen a midfield three, which has been incredible. It includes Django Herrera, who was formerly on Man City's books and spent quite a lot of time at Granada and those sort of Sam Tyre's favourite players. He's been exceptional. And behind him as a pivot, um, Alex Garcia, for my money, has been the second best player behind Jude Bellingham in, in La Liga this season, especially in mm. midfield. He, he's been truly remarkable. And for a journeyman player to come in and have this kind of impact and this kind of season at Girona has been stunning. Now we know Savio's off. He's off to Man City in the summer. Whether this team can be held together or not is you know, a question that many will ask. But I think what he's done here and the way that this team have developed and the style of play that he's implemented, you know, the greatest compliment I think I've heard anyone give him was after they played Barcelona off the park and someone said, Girona play like Barcelona think they do. And I thought that was a lovely kind of way. They were like, the Barcelona style of play was on, on show tonight between Barcelona and Girona. It was just the other Catalan <laughs> club playing it. And it's a pretty you know, high resume. It's a pretty high bar. But yeah. I think that maybe the one that they should be most worried about this summer is, is losing Michelle because there's going to be lots of people interested. I honestly don't know. This is the one, one person on the list that I don't necessarily know what happens with. And I wonder what this looks like in a system where he has less control over exactly how the team play. So I don't know what the move is, but we know Newcastle were interested. There's talk of City wanting him to keep him at Girona, to keep an eye on him for another year, but for a couple of years, if Pep Guardiola moves on, whether he could be a potential replacement for that. I don't actually see it as someone's going to come in and pinch him straight away. But I think that we're talking about someone whose reputation in the game has grown an immense amount over the last seven months or so. Yeah, I mean, he's a bit older than the other ones you've mentioned so far. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm interested as to what the bar is here for how old someone can be an emerging manager. But I, I went guess under 50. Under 50, okay. Um, oh, it makes me feel nice and young. Thank you, mate. Uh, You're welcome, young. mate. Young as under 50. That's great. That's exactly the kind of He's also training. only been around for sort of seven years. I was going to say, is that more that, the He's case only had a it. senior job yeah. for six of those. And a lot of yeah. that was in Ned Segunda. So what, three of those six years have been in the second Quick tier. Yeah. It's not like he's had loads and loads of time within the game as, you know, a top tier manager. I think, you know, I couldn't be putting an emerging manager in here as someone who's, you know, knocked around in the Bundesliga for 10 years or has managed yeah. one of the biggest clubs in the world. I think that's the, kind of caveat here we're looking at people who maybe could make a jump yeah no it doesn't make sense mate I'm, I, I imagine that was where this was coming from but um yeah certainly somebody obviously being part of the city group that will look to rise through those ranks but you can't wait forever and other clubs will need to move while Guardiola is still in a job if they want to get him out of there yeah I mean this is it and I but I don't know what that looks like and I don't know he's the only as I said he's the only one here who I don't have like a path that I think would be a good path. I think yeah. that 
someone is going to get a very good coach here, but I'm not sure. I actually think he stick. I think he sticks around, which is probably why he's here. And I mean, it, it gives us a nice kind of segue into number two, which is Huben Amorim at Sporting. He's been around for so long as a head coach now that it's easy to forget he's still 39 years old. <laughs> But he's taken sporting from the brink of irrelevancy, to be honest, amongst Portugal's big three and back to at least level pegging, but perhaps even the top of the pile, certainly this year, I think. And in his three full seasons as sporting manager, he's won the league once and the league cup twice. And sporting our favourites to go on and win the title again this season. Obviously, I've called it in the bag, so we can just basically say that that's done. He also won the League Cup with Braga when he was there for four months before what was at the most expensive, at the time, the most expensive managerial transfer ever when he joined Sporting for 10 million euros in a time of absolute turmoil at the club. Now, he turned that around in two ways. Like, firstly, on the pitch, his 3 4 3 is his bread and butter, and he rarely strays from his preferred system. Three centre backs, two of which are expected to get wide and cover ground, move into spaces to see danger and intercept it, as well as moving into midfield at times. Two wing-backs who have a real emphasis on getting forward and two defensive midfielders who cover that attacking potential. Two inside forwards who play off a physical number nine. It's adaptable and flexible in-game and Amorim has almost perfected his use of it. I think what's perhaps even more impressive is perhaps the fact that he's kept sporting competitive despite a regular exodus of talent. So his original midfield four, for example, was Nuno Mensch, Graal Polina, Mateusz Nunes, and Pedro Porro, all of whom ended up leaving the club over the next 18 months. Mm. And Sporting have barely dropped off. Yes, they were a little bit further away last year, but they have managed to turn that around again this year and rise back to the top of the pile. But the second and perhaps most important part of the way that he turned this around is that Amorim is a master communicator. Although there is a caveat here in that how this translates outside of his native Portugal is obviously yet to be seen. He's got a postgraduate degree in psychomotor education, I found out, which is basically a course designed to help influence the personal development of individuals within a group context, which obviously makes a lot of sense in a football environment. (laughs) Um, He's an extremely positive influence, and I think it's something that serves sporting incredibly well in recent years. So where next? I actually think he stays at sporting, which is why he's not top of this list, because... Of everyone here, I think he's proved the most already. I think he has the potential to translate that almost anywhere on the planet. And I think every big club in the world who plays a who would be willing to play this system. So I don't think Barcelona should go here because if Barcelona started playing a 3-4-3, I think there'd be riots that camp now. But for anyone who would be willing to implement this kind of system, I think he's probably the best at it in the world right now. So I think he stays at Sporting. But if I were in charge of Juventus, this is what I'd be doing. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, from a Premier League perspective, I've seen him linked before with Chelsea. I know Villa had a look at him. Man United have definitely been linked in the past too. Would have surprised me if Newcastle had him in their sights for life after Eddie Howe or something like that. Um, but yeah, he seems to be considered a bit of a sure thing that he's going to be a success wherever he goes next. Do you think that Juve is a good fit in terms of the league and this next step rather than coming to the Premier League? Is that why you think that? Or just because Juve need a manager with a bit more um, logic and tactics? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, we look back at the great Juve teams and so much of it was based on that 3-4-3, three, three, right? So much of it was based on the three at the back. And they're a team and a fan base who won't be averse to the idea of that if it's utilised in the right way. And I know that we've seen complaints about Allegri's use of three at the back. But I think that's because of the way that Allegri ball works, right? It's not, it's mm. not necessarily that there are three defenders on the pitch. It's actually the fact that Allegri just doesn't really do anything in his attacking components, apart from in the cup, apparently, where he becomes an absolute monster. But I think that Amorim, the way he gets forward, and look, the fact that Sporting have been rampant in front of goal in the last couple of weeks shows exactly the potential and the attacking potential of what this is because the wingbacks basically play as wingers, right? And then you're kind of, you've got this five across the front line, which ends with your number nine, which at the moment is Jock and he's having an absolutely sensational first season in Portugal. The two interior players who, you know, Marcus Edwards is often one of them. Um, and then there's, there's kind of a, a, a rotating cast on the other. Sometimes it's Pedro Gonçalves and then the fullbacks get wide and high. And 
actually, when you're kind of dropping in, sometimes that midfield duo, which has been Hidamasi Marita and Morten Hulman, who's been brilliant as a replacement for, for Perlinia, by the way, they finally got that man through the door. And, and for last year, Manuel Agate leaving as well, Hulman has been remarkable, absolutely stunning in that role. And one of the best signings of the season, I think, as, as far as I'm concerned. But sometimes Pedro Gonçalves drops into that midfield too when they feel that they do have that more attacking sense and they do feel like they're on top and it allows them to get another body into that final third. So that flexibility and adaptability around it, I think means that it's not a, oh, this is an incredibly defensive formation. It's just he prefers having those three centre-backs from which to work. And so I think that someone like Juventus would love a manager who has this kind of attacking nous whilst being based on the principles that brought them so much success before. Yeah, absolutely. That's fair enough, mate. Um, yeah, I think it's obviously a, a name that you would expect to see on a list like this. So it's always important to underline the credentials. Um, I guess the interest is around who's going to be number one. <laughs> well, I think that that one was a, a little bit more <laughs> obvious. I, I mean, I did really want to put, I really wanted to put Amorim as number one because I think he's the best manager on this list. He's but... can't think who it'll be. Yeah, Xavi um, Alonso comes in and uh, number <laughs> one. Uh, still probably football's most handsome man at 42 years old. I'll try to talk to me, mate. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I got you're, not 42, for you're not 42 yet. <laughs> no, yeah, I, as soon as you said 40, the most handsome man, 40. I was like, oh, go on, Jack. Plead the ego. Plead the oh, ego. Is he you're 42, right. is he? You've only got oh, two man. more years and you can take this title, mate. Oh, it's all good. Um, Xavi Alonso took over Leverkusen last year with the team languishing in a relegation scrap. They were second from bottom. Steered them to Europa League place in the league and got to the Europa League semi-finals before going one further this year and obviously pushing them into title contention. They are five points clear, as you said, at the top of Bayern Munich at the top of the Bundesliga. The hype machine around Alonso went into absolute overdrive, right? And this mm -hmm. is the thing that's interesting about this because... Obviously, the links are there and the fact that he reportedly has this clause in his contract that means that one of the three clubs he played for, or at least Bayern, Liverpool and Real Madrid, have you know a, a different payout in his contract to anybody else. It all sort of starts to pile up, doesn't it? But I mean, what's really impressive about Alonso, and I mentioned this a bit about Mota, is the way that he took his time, waited until he felt he was ready, and then took the job and has absolutely smashed it out of the park. And, you know, there was talk when he was, he was there managing Real Madrid's under 11s and under 12s. Then he moved to Real Sociedad back to his hometown and coached the B team for a while. When he was there, he turned down an offer to go and coach Borussia Mönchengladbach because he wasn't ready. He didn't feel like he was ready to take that job on. And then he finally took the Leverkusen job and everything since has been you know, pretty much one-way traffic, right? They've been, they've turned from an absolute mess at the back into a team that are defensively cohesive. That three at the back system, again, it's like Amorim's in some ways in that it doesn't mean that they are suddenly just a very, very defensive unit. This is still a tide that can go out and absolutely dominate teams from a three at the back position. But I don't think Alonso's wedded to it. And I think this is what's interesting here is that people are going, oh, Alonso might take over Liverpool. What will his 3-4-3 look like at Liverpool? I don't believe that he'll play that. I don't no. believe that Xabi Alonso will feel the need to play the same system with differing players at his disposal. What I actually do have kind of a little bit of a, not concern, but I'll be interested to see how it develops, is the way that Leverkusen play is through lots of quick interchanges through the middle. Now, again, this could change, and considering Xabi Alonso was the master of the switch pass, you know, you can imagine him looking at Trent Alexander-Arnold and thinking, oh, that's an interesting little quirk that I could maybe utilise. But Leverkusen don't play like that. Leverkusen play the ball through the middle. They make these third-man runs in there that allow them to build like triangles through there and get the ball into Florian Wirtz, who is able to basically make things happen in the middle. And that's how Leverkusen attack. And there's a reason that the wing backs are such high goal scorers. It's because they're not expected to stay wide and cross the ball into these areas. They are allowed to get in there and make things happen and, and get into the air and get into goal scoring positions because Leverkusen aren't building down the flanks. And the way that that would translate to a Liverpool side who have been so reliant on fullbacks getting into wide areas and, and putting in crosses for the players in the middle to get on the end of is an interesting transition, I think. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's not going to work. I just would be interested to see it. But Alonso has that flexibility. And I think the fact that he made a different system with the youth teams at Real Sociedad who have been asked to kind of mirror a little bit more of what Alguacil does with the first team, 
it's going to be interesting to see what that Nexic looks like. And, and I think it's important to remember that as these links develop, that, you know, people are thinking about the way that Leverkusen play right now and thinking, oh, what does that look like at Real Madrid? What does that look like at Liverpool? I would bet my bottom dollar that it, whatever he uses, whatever system or whatever tactical setup he uses at these, at his next club will be completely different because I think he's making the most of the players he's got. And that in itself is an incredible trait. Yeah, um, I'll be amazed if he's not the next Liverpool manager. I feel like it's a fail-proof announcement. I can't see that there's any Liverpool fan who would have a problem with Xavi Alonso being the successor to Jurgen Klopp at this moment in time. Um, and I think you consider, OK, you could say, well, what if he wins the, does win the league with Bayer Leverkusen? Surely he'd want to stay for that next phase and go into the Champions League and try to defend this title. Don't think he would. He'd go and play in the Champions League with Liverpool and try that to challenge himself. And what more can he actually do at Leverkusen beyond this? This is going to be a historic moment, like genuinely like a, a part of their history that, you know, defines who they are as a club and another manager can go in there and try to take that on. For Xavi Alonso and Liverpool, I feel it's kind of like written now that this will happen and... I just think it will work. I just think when you consider what they've got within their squad already, not really to replicate what he's done, but to give him different options in terms of his style of play, it's all there. I think that it would satisfy the current squad that they he can take on what Jurgen Klopp's done. He's personable as well, which yeah, I think is this whole personality is massive. Like really obviously you see him key. speaking afterwards and you see what, how he engages. He did a brilliant interview with, with Archer in Tut at the weekend, but you see how he engages with the media, the fans, all of that is part of, he's not the same as Klopp. He's not going to be there fist pumping the crowd. I don't think, and giving it all that, but I think there is a warmness and a personality to him. The Liverpool fans, obviously they love him already, but would warm to as a coach as well. And I think that that's really important when you're looking at, the emotional fallout from someone like Klopp leaving. Yeah, you can't rattle people. Um, so I know they would never appoint Jose Mourinho, but if you were to go for somebody of that type, you would disrupt everything that Klopp had built and what was great about him, not just what we see on the pitch, but off it too. That would be a tragedy. And Xavi Alonso would be a tragedy for both parties, right? Like this yeah. is the thing. It wouldn't suit Mourinho either. And I'm, I'm not suggesting they would do this. And I don't think he would take it either. No, way. No, no, no. But it, it is worth pointing out that that's not the same thing. And you do need to, they need to manage this nicely. And look, we talked about with Mourinho leaving Roma, right? How do you keep a fan base on side when you've just sacked the most popular manager in the last 20 years? Well, you appoint Daniele De Rossi because whatever happens on the pitch between here and the end of the season is kind of one thing. But actually having the fans on side because they love De Rossi, even if they're angry at you for sacking Mourinho, is going to turn things around pretty quickly and keep them sweet. And I think that's important. So I think you're, you're right. Like Liverpool remains the obvious answer. But I just yeah. can't rule Bayern out because it'd be incredibly on brand for them to make a move in the summer for this and actually put everything up in the air because obviously he has a relationship there as well. And yeah. This is what Bayern do, right? They 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 look yeah. at the Bundesliga. They go right. Let's take the best of the the best of the best. Let's bring them in and make sure that we can dominate. And if they see a manager beat them, they will want that manager through the door. Yeah. And if I was to be guessing over what would happen here, if it really is looking like Tuchel isn't going to overhaul Leverkusen, I could see Bayern announcing early that they're parting ways with him, put somebody else in. And go after Alonso, Alonso aggressively. aggressively. The, the Mario the Goetze, the, the Mario Goetze approach at Dortmund, announcing Properly. him before he played against them in the yeah. Premier League final. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, right, a couple yeah. of honourable mentions. Uh, Osasuna's Jagaba Arasate, who's doing a wonderful job in Pamplona. They are playing some of the most aggressive, direct football in La Liga, and I do wonder because there's been murmurings that Barcelona might have a look at reappointing Ernesto Valverde. If that happens, he feels like a real nice follow-up option for Athletic Club. So just want mm -hmm. to keep an eye on there. Well, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's worth bearing in mind. Um, yeah. Will still at home, where yeah. we continue to go from strength to strength. Um, but I think he needs a couple more years just honing that just yet. And then Francesco Faraoli at Nice, who's turned 
them into Champions League contenders. Came up through a bit of a random path. Obviously, we know, everyone knows he was the Zerbi's assistant, but just bopped around in Turkey for a while, honing his craft before coming into Nice and yeah, doing a phenomenal job with them as well. So just a couple to, to bear in mind as well. Very good, mate. I enjoyed that. Um, you gave me some wisdom. I'm always up for some guru wisdom to take on board. Well, talking of guru wisdom, we'll be back after the break with part three. I talk about this all the time, but I really do love coffee, Rank Squad. I've tried pretty much everything there is to offer out there, but recently I came across a new coffee experience that has blown my mind. Laird Superfood Creamers are crafted from the highest quality, all-natural, real food ingredients. I really don't think I'll be going back to anything else. My coffee journey feels complete. Are you ready to feel more energised, focused and supported? Go to LairdSuperfood.com and add nourishing plant-based foods to fuel you from sunrise to sunset. Use our promo, Ranks15, at checkout to save 15% off your purchase today. Our promo code, Ranks15, at checkout to save 15% off your purchase today. Welcome back to Ranks FC, time for part three. And of course, some guru wisdom. Over to the boys. Guru wisdom, guru wisdom, guru wisdom. Guru wisdom indeed. Thanks, Jones boys. Um, Bit of a different one this week for me, mate, because um, there was a tweet that kept cropping up on all sorts of socials for me um i don't know why i don't think it was like a brand new tweet i think it had been recirculated a bit but i saw it on twitter and then it popped up on my facebook and i saw it on reddit and it kept it was stuck at the back of my mind for a few days and i was like this is so stupid but also i can't stop thinking about how we could ever prove it and how fun it would be to prove it um so here's the tweet i confidently believe the 68 million people in the UK would outdrink the 330 million Americans in a nationwide head to head. I can't stop thinking about this being put to the test, mate. Um, now, my guru wisdom You'd tells me. You'd have to surely sample size it. You'd have to, like, so you couldn't actually it. set everyone up, right? You'd have to just well, take 100 it, random people and 330 random people and do it like that. So that's what I was thinking. I was like, this needs to be put to the test. Imagine you find a 30 year old female teacher from Columbus, Ohio, and pit her against a 30 year old female teacher from Basildon, Essex. No, but Go, you can't do that. Head. You can't do that. It has, to be, it has to be random samples. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Well, no, it does because you do it on a large scale. You've got to go head to heads. And then it's a, it, basically, I think someone comes up with... You'd, have to, get work three, you'd have to get three teachers from Columbus, Ohio, and one from Basildon. It would have to work with the ratios, right? Yeah, fine. That's, that's fine. But still, it needs to become like a YouTube show. And you get like someone from the University of Texas goes head to head with someone from the University of Glasgow. You go like for like in terms of like where you're at demographically. I don't know, like a 40 year old mum of three from New York goes up against a mum of three from London or, or three versus one, whatever, whatever, whichever way you want to pit it. But I'm fascinated by this idea, mate. I don't believe for one second that the UK's drinking culture is that supreme compared to America's, though. Well, what are the I numbers? And I'll do a ratio, and this is it. Well, it said, I mean, there's also it's obviously flawed because, I mean, loads of these people are children, and also there's loads of people that don't drink. But it says 68 million in the UK right. against 330 million Americans. Okay, let's so, work I mean, these are the figures from the tweet. I have no idea if these are actual figures, but that's what's no, put out there. Fine. So it's, you'd, you'd have to out drink 4.85 people each. Not happening, is it? I don't think so, no. <laughs> Because the, the thing is, I, well, I, when I, I was doing... I fancy this, myself against one, maybe one and a half people, but not when against 4.85 people. I don't think so, people. mate. This is the thing. When I was doing the comparisons of 1v1, it was because I actually think the Americans on a 1v1 basis beat us a lot of the time. I mean, I've been out with loads of Americans drinking. They can, they can chuck it away. They can drink. The bar culture in America is sensational. If you go into the dive bars across America, mate, you're seeing some proper drinkers there. I know we get it too in like... I, I was going to say, you haven't been to the village in with me. Con clubs, but 
I don't know that it's necessarily on that much of a different level to what you're getting across America. No, nor do I. Nor do I. I'm, um, I'm, with, you. I'm with you on this. I, like, I would fancy myself most things against one person of the same age and ilk. I wouldn't. I'm not a good enough drinker. I can last. I can do pay. I can last a long time, but I can't drink that much. My body just doesn't hold it. Yeah, um, I like. I, I mean, it, it kind of depends what you're talking about. Like, I'm really bad at like downing things. Dreadful at it, in fact. But like, I I feel like my longevity and engine. Yeah, is you're good at that. Most. You're always out. You know, me. We have we both have a good record of staying out. Um, but. Just, yeah, no just even when I think of like four point eight five human beings. <laughs> even when I think about like Christmases I've had with Taylor's family and extended family, they properly drink. Like I can remember various times when someone just out of nowhere pulls out a bottle of Fireball from their backpack or something, and suddenly we're all doing shots. Like, my aunt Jackie isn't doing that. <laughs> 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 she'll have a Bacardi and Coke, but that's about it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think you're right on this. I mean, could you lo- could you like loan people in? If the UK could like loan like loan Ireland, they might have a shot. I'm a bit afraid that I've just given someone an idea here who's actually works for like a TV company or is actually good at setting up YouTube shows and actually gets this going and ends up making a fortune on the back of my idea. But I'm actually okay with it because i want to see it played out so if you are that person and you want more ideas like this get in touch because i've got other head-to-heads like a 60 year old californian surfer up against a 60 year old surfer from cornwall see how those two go head to head um (laughs) there's loads of comparisons we're we're just executive producers this show i think if someone wants to fund it get in touch i think this is this is well worth well worth a a follow-up Um, and on that bombshell, I think it's probably time for us to call it a day. Thank you very much for that guru wisdom. I very much enjoyed it. Um, this has been Ranks FC. Thank you so much for listening as ever. We'll be back, well, later on tonight or first thing tomorrow morning with a Champions League takeaway. As I mentioned at the top, the return of UE Ultras is coming as well. The question tweets out on our Patreon now. So if you fancy getting involved with the creation and the background, and also the creation of podcasts like this one, where the idea has come from our listeners, which we love to have, then the Patreon link, as ever, is in the description. We'd love to have you on board for all that extra content that we're making every single week. But for now, a massive thank you to our transfer group, Mr. Dean Jones. Cheers, mate. I've been Jack Collins, Name of Hearts. This has been Ranks FC. Thank you so much for listening as ever. And we'll see you later on in the week, gang. Enjoy all the football that's going on over the next couple of days. We certainly will be. Take it easy. Peace. Final seconds of the game. A chance to score and the chance has gone begging. If your business's commerce platform keeps missing the target on golden opportunities, get the MVP you deserve. Get Shopify. (coughs) Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool that you need to start, run and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed football boots from Shopify's in-person POS system or you're vending vintage shirts on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ranks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com forward slash ranks to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash ranks.